Hi, welcome to Lessons with Laura. I'm Laura Ingalls Gunn. This week we're going to be featuring Little House in the Big Woods. This was the first book in the Little House series written by Laura Ingalls Wilder and published in 1932. We're going to be pulling a few activities from the pages of this book and they'll include making a vinegar pie, which doesn't sound good at all, but we'll see. Um, making paper dolls, just like Ma would have made for Laura and Mary all those years ago, as well as looking at a special dress worn by one of Charles Ingalls' sister at the dance at Grandpa's. So let's get started with some of the stories. The first excerpt that I'm going to read is a chapter called Dance at Grandpa's. And in this story, the Ingalls family travels to the home of Charles's parents, Laura and Lansford Ingalls. These are the paternal grandparents of Laura Ingalls Wilder and my great, great, great grandparents. In the story, there is a dance to celebrate the harvesting of the maple syrup and Laura is fascinated by the preparations being made by her two aunts, Charles's younger sisters. There is Aunt Ruby as well as Aunt Dosha, which is also sometimes pronounced Dosia. It depends on what part of the country you are from. I'm going to say dosha just for um, ease in reading. Aunt Dosha's dress was a sprigged print, dark blue, with sprigs of red flowers and green leaves thick upon it. The basque was buttoned down the front with black buttons, which looked so exactly like juicy big blackberries that Laura wanted to taste them. Aunt Ruby's dress was wine-colored calico, covered all over with a feathery pattern in lighter wine color. It buttoned with gold-colored buttons, and every button had a little castle and a tree carved on it. Aunt Dosha's pretty white collar was fastened in front with a large round cameo pin, which had a lady's head on it. But Aunt Ruby pinned her collar with a red rose made of sealing wax. A few years ago, one of the very first dresses I made was inspired by the descriptions of Aunt Dosha's dress, so I'd like to show that to you now. For this week's historical fashion segment, I wanted to feature a dress that I had made a few years ago based on the description um, that Laura Ingalls Wilder had given in the book Little House in the Big Woods. Now, we know that this book probably took place at around 1870 to 1871, and we base that um, on the description of how old Carrie is. Uh, Laura describes her little sister Carrie as a new baby, a small infant, um, and Carrie uh, was born on August 3rd, and this past August actually would have been her 150th birthday. So based on calculations, um, that's the year that we're kind of focusing on. And in the historical fashion timeline, that puts us at the very beginning of the early bustle period. Now, Laura's descriptions of her two aunt's dresses in the chapter Dance at Grandpa's describe the skirt still as very full. So it's quite possible that they were still wearing the big hoop 
or rounded skirts of the Romantic era, which had been the fashion in the decade previously. So we're going to somewhat focus on that, even though it's very possible this would have been the early bustle period. Now the very first layer um, a lady might put on would have been a pair of split drawers. I can't really um, put those on my mannequins, so we'll just set these aside. The next layer would have been a chemise. Now the chemise was also sometimes used as a nightgown and it was changed very regularly. This was a layer of protection um, to absorb sweat and oils and would help keep the outer garments fresher longer. So this would have been the style of chemise that Laura's aunts would have worn. And then uh, they would have next put on their stockings. Now Laura describes the stockings as white in the chapter, um, but stockings came in all sorts of colors. They could be cotton, wool, or even fine silk. And then, strange as it may seem, they would have put on their shoes next. And the reason for this is because once they were laced up in their corset, it's a little bit more difficult to bend over to um, button up your shoes. So, this is the corset that I wear, um, and it was made specifically for me by Red Threaded. The thing about um, a corset is on the human body it works because it molds and is soft. I can't get it to go around a hard dress form. So just know that the next layer would have been the corset. Now to get the look of full skirts, um, there were two ways to do this. Um, women could have worn several petticoats and this was really good also to add layers of warmth. They made petticoats out of silk, out of wool, um, cotton, um, not so much linen uh, during this time. And this is a corded petticoat. It is created by just doing row after row of cording. And so they could have worn a couple layers of these. Um, there were also hoop petticoats, which is what I am going to put on the mannequin. It's just a little bit easier. Now, the thing about the hoop is because um, it had wire or even whalebone at that time, um, it would leave a ridge where each of your wires or whale bones were. So even after just this petticoat, you would have wanted to put one or two petticoats over this because you wanted to ensure that you couldn't see the lines of the wires that this type of petticoat would have made. Now, the interesting thing about pioneering families is it's quite possible that their petticoats could have been colored. Um, women would often take their dresses that had started to show signs of wear and just remove the bodice portion and use um, the existing skirt portion as one of their petticoats. So the next layer that I'm going to put on is this petticoat. We're going to pretend that this is a thrifty um, pioneering woman and she has repurposed 
her skirts to create a petticoat. And we're just going to button it on. And then we're going to make sure that we cover every section of the hoop skirt so that you can't see any lines. It smooths out all of the lines that a hoop might possibly make. And believe it or not, if she wanted some additional warmth, she might have um, even added an additional layer. My, the weight of these clothes are causing my dress form to sink down. So she may end up on the floor at the end of this and we'll all have to readjust it. Uh, but that, that leads me to a really good point. Um, often by the time a woman finished dressing in her multiple layers of clothing, she could perhaps have up to 20 pounds of undergarments, clothing, and outer garments on. Um, when you hear about, you know, women sadly drowning, um, it was because if they would happen to fall into a lake, um, the weight of their garments um, could absolutely pull them down and trying to kick and fight uh, was very difficult um, with the numerous layers of petticoats and skirts. So that's often um, why that sadly happened. So after you have put on all those layers, you're then going to put on your dress. And why I would like to remake this dress is I actually gathered this dress and it probably should have been cartridge pleated just for the sheer amount of fabric, as you can see, that is in this skirt. Um, I'm going to readjust my dress form, so bear with me for a second. Okay, we are back and Aunt Dosha's dress is on the dress form. And as you can see, it is a dark blue print with sprigged flowers and green leaves. I tried for many, many months to find buttons that looked like juicy blackberries. I even have a dear friend, Becky, who collects antique buttons, and I just didn't have any luck. If you happen to know where um, any buttons might be found that look like blackberries, please let me know. Because uh, as I said, I am going to update this um, dress sometime in the future. Now, it talks about um, that she added a white collar to her dress. And that was often done. They would add both collars and cuffs to the dress. Um, those could be taken off and laundered very easily uh, because we often will get neck grime or just body oils in those two areas, sometimes food around our cuffs. And so again, um, just trying to extend the life of the fabric of the outer garment was the reason collar and cuffs were worn. It mentions that in the center she um, pinned a cameo. Now Laura doesn't say whether this is um, a shell cameo or a painted cameo. Whenever I'm costuming I try to include an antique element or two um, in my presentation and a way I can often do this is through the use of jewelry. So I thought I would show you um, some of the brooches that I have. Um, this I actually found, can you see that? Is it gonna, oh, maybe, maybe if I put it up to my face then it'll focus. Can you see? There we go. So I found that in a button, old button collection, 
and I had my jeweler um, apply a pin to it. So that is one of the cameos that I have. Um, this is a very old cameo. Let's see, there we go. It is hand painted on glass. I really love this one. She's a favorite. She was a gift from my cousin Tara, who has amazing taste. But the things that I often wear are called love tokens. And I'm sure you have heard this term before. Um, love tokens date back to the 1400s, but it was the Victorians that really took it to the next level. Um, sailors and soldiers that were going off um, would leave a little token with um, their sweetheart to remember them by. And basically what it is, is it is a coin that has been smoothed out and then engraved. So it would take a lot of work to get the surface smooth. During the Victorian era, the seated Liberty dime was the most popular for, let's see if we can get it to focus. Come on, focus, maybe. There we go, can you see that? So, and then on the other side, they had smoothed it and engraved their initials. Now, um, these happen to be my husband's initials, so it's really perfect. Um, he is a retired veteran, so, you know, had we time traveled back, uh, it's quite possible he would have been a soldier. And so I, I love to wear this one. Um, I also have one, we'll see if it can pick up. There we go. So that actually says Laura. And I think this was probably from a sailor because it is a Peruvian coin. And so those are my, my two favorite brooches that I often wear. And so I hope you have enjoyed um, looking at Dosha's dress and I'll bring it in for a few close-ups. It does need some work on the bodice and as I said, I'd like to now cartridge pleat this. The collar up here has never quite lain uh, correctly, so a few adjustments need to be made. But um, it is really precious, beautiful fabric from the Little House on the Prairie line by Andover, so I do hope to remake it in the future. The recipe that we're going to make today is vinegar pie and it comes from the chapter titled Christmas. And vinegar pie was actually quite a popular pie um, with pioneer families. It didn't require a lot of specialized ingredients and the apple cider vinegar that was used also gave the necessary vitamin C um, that families needed because there often wasn't fresh fruit. Ma was busy all day long cooking good things for Christmas. She baked salt rising bread and Ryan engine bread and Swedish crackers and a huge pan of baked beans with salt pork and molasses. She baked vinegar pies and dried apple pies and filled a big jar with cookies and she let Laura and Mary lick the cake spoon. So I just had to try vinegar pie because I've never had it before. And let's head into the kitchen to start making it. 
Welcome to the kitchen of Storybook Cottage. The table has been set for a special dinner. My daughter is home for a visit. She lives in Nashville. I've used the patchwork napkins that I made a few years ago, and I'll link below in the comments for the tutorial. Simple apple votives. And the floral arrangement is in an old copper pot. Hello, Miss Grace. Over on this wall is where I hang my aprons. And I change them out with the seasons. And a French painting that shows a harvest scene. I don't even mind that the frame is broken. There's still beauty and brokenness. My sweet little Jersey cows. I like a nice big work surface to prepare things. Many of the recipes that we'll be using in the series will come from the Little House Cookbook. Grace often hangs out in the window. And I love my big windows that let in a lot of light. Supplies and cutting boards. That leads into the dining room. And this is the brick hearth area. I've preheated the oven, so let's get cooking. Hi, this week we're going to make a vinegar pie. That didn't sound too appetizing to me, so I just had to try it. The recipe um, can be found in both the Laura Ingalls Wilder Companion as well as the Little House Cookbook. Now, I already went ahead and made my pastry for the pie, and it is well chilled. You're going to need some flour, brown sugar, white sugar, butter and nutmeg, some eggs, water, and apple cider vinegar. Now, to get as close to the type of vinegar that the pioneers would have used, you want to select an organic apple cider vinegar which contains the mother. And that is basically um, the starter for any type of vinegar. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started with the recipe. Just for a little deviation, I'm also going to add some dried apple slices to one half side of the pie for a little bit of fun because they also would have had dried fruit, particularly when they were crossing the plains um, and prairies to go to the next location where they were moving to. So you want to mix the dry ingredients first. So we're going to add in the sugar and the brown sugar and the flour and the nutmeg. And we're just going to give it just a little blend just to get it mixed. Because you don't want to over mix or over beat your water and eggs. So we're just going to get all the ingredients well mixed. So I'm going to stop the blender now because it looks pretty good and I'll show you. So get a fork out. There's a little bit of my um, brown sugar is was a little bit hard. I thought I had softened it. So I'm just going to break up the last few bits with a fork. Now, of course, 
Ma would have done all this mixing by hand anyways. They would not have had a mixer like I am using today. But just for speed and ease, we are going to use some of the modern conveniences. So you can see it's well mixed. And so now you're going to add your wet ingredients. So we're going to add two eggs. And luckily my built-in trash area is right here. So that makes it nice. And I think the vinegar, and I'm thinking, oh, three tablespoons of vinegar. Oh my goodness. But I think with the amount of sugar that's in the recipe, it's going to make for a nice, sweet, and tart mix. You know, when you were far from home, you had to keep hand on hand items that would travel well. And if you had a farm, you probably would have had a cow as well as some chickens to make your um, butter and, of course, have your eggs. And then we'll add our water. And then we're going to turn on the mixer again, slowly at first. Ooh, this looks kind of soupy. But I imagine that the flour acts as a thickening agent and it will thicken up, I hope. And it might be a total failure. And that's okay too. I'm sure, you know, they would have often been cooking over an open hearth or tricky wood burning stoves. And both of those things to learn how to cook and master recipes, there's a steep learning curve. So I'm sure they ate a lot of burnt dinners, if you will. So I'm going to push this forward. And one of the details that I did on my pie crust is since we're studying Little House in the Big Woods, I cut out some decorative trees to edge around the, the pie crust just for some interest. Now, my butter is still Kind of, it's supposed to be melted or well mixed. So we're gonna give it a few more stirs. And just for something interesting, on one side, I'm gonna add in the dried apples. It feels as if this mix is very similar to the pecan pie base that I make at Thanksgiving. Very sugary sweet. So to kind of add a bit of texture to the, what is I'm presuming is going to be a custard-like filling, I think the apples on one side might be fun. We'll make sure, it, as I said, this is really soupy. I hope it sets up, but we're, we're going to give it a go. So it goes into a 400 degree oven for 30 minutes. So I'm going to pop it in and then we'll let it cool and hopefully it will set up. Okay. This week's craft activity comes from a chapter called Winter Days. After the day's work was done, Ma sometimes cut paper dolls for them. She cut the dolls out of stiff white paper and drew the faces with a pencil. Then, from bits of colored paper, 
She cut dresses and hats, ribbons and laces, so that Laura and Mary could dress their dolls beautifully. But the best time of all was at night when Pa came home. I thought it would be fun to make some paper dolls of our own. So let's head on over to the desk so we can start some crafting. When I was a little girl, I would spend hours playing with my paper dolls. I created a magical world um, filled with amazing stories. I uh, would spend hours um, making dresses for my little dolls. And sadly, I think paper dolls have fallen a bit out of fashion, which is quite a shame because it really does um, encourage your children or grandchildren uh, to really use their creativity and embrace this amazing mind that we have. Uh, this was a paper doll set that belonged to my daughter when she was small. The paper doll had actually been applied to plywood and there was a dowel system and you could attach various dresses to the doll and then she had this wooden stand and there was even an elaborate birthday dress and a cake scene that you can kind of see. So th this was so fun that I had to keep it even though she outgrew it many, many years ago. Um, to find some paper dolls was actually very easy. I went on Pinterest and typed in Little House Paper Dolls and several pages actually came up. And the beauty of um, creating your own paper dolls is that it can teach children how to use the scissors and um, the dexterity in using scissors hand-eye coordination is um, a, a learning skill that comes from paper dolls and uh, there are various ways to make them stand this set uses a strip of paper and some slits in the paper and you can either place them in the front so that you can see the name this is Mary or you can place them in the back so you can see Laura's cute bare feet and here's Pa with his fiddle I really like this um, set from the Little House on the Prairie site. It is available um, free to download and I will put all of the links down below in the comments on how you can find this easily. Uh, the beauty about this set is that you can create a paper doll that looks exactly like you. So whether you have brown hair, red hair, maybe black hair, even blue hair, um, you can create a doll that looks exactly like you. So that was a really neat set that I found. This set reminded me of the fashions that they wore on the television show. So if you're a fan of the show, you might like these dolls. There is an official um, Little House on the Prairie paper doll book. And again, I'll, I'll link that down below for you. If you have older kids or kids that need a, a bit more of a challenge, there is a site that's created um, all of the homes and the buildings in town from the television show. So um, it does recommend that this project in particular is for older kids and uh, I just love you know the little sets you can create an entire diorama with backdrops and covered wagons and animals of 
all types, um, chickens, cows, the oxen. And so it, it just is a wonderful way to really encourage creativity. And these paper dolls will not go to waste. I'm going to pop them in the mail to a few of my nieces and nephews that I think will really enjoy them. And I would love to hear if you do this craft and which paper doll you um, select. Leave me a comment down below. I hope you liked this week's video. Next week we'll be moving on to Farmer Boy, which is one of my favorite books in the Little House series. And so be sure to come back for that. Hit the subscribe button um, so that you'll be notified when the video uploads. Have a great day.